three, two, one. Today's episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Is there something stopping you from taking that next step in your life? Is there something blocking you from being happy? Well, then you should check out BetterHelp.com. BetterHelp is an online service that will connect you with one of their professional personal counselors in under 48 hours. Their counselors are specialized in many areas, including stress, anxiety, anger, and depression. You'll be able to schedule weekly video or phone sessions with your counselor in a safe and private online environment. BetterHelp is also more affordable and and a more convenient option than the traditional in-person counseling. We here at the 2-on-1 Podcast want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash listener. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash listener. Daniel, we are back. We are. It's just the two of us today, though. Adam will be back, but mm-hmm. today it's just the two of us. Um, there is so much going on. There is. I feel like we, like, or at least personally, and you, you tell me otherwise, but I felt like because of uh, the increase in COVID recently, it felt like there was just going to be this lack of news. And I, I don't think that's been the case. Yeah, I it's kind of funny where we talk about these other stories that are going on, but then we're like, you know, we had a good discussion about it and let's move forward. But then hold on. There's like little details each time for each story. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, one thing I actually kind of learned about when we did this podcast is never underestimate the power of someone releasing a personal feature. Oh yeah. Yes. It comes out pretty often. And I, I'm realizing that now. And, and we will get, get to that article because we did not talk about it last episode but before we start you are wearing a jersey and i I now realize that uh it feels like a few weeks ago now you did mention that a a jersey had arrived but you Mm -hmm. hadn't opened the box yet i did not the box has been opened what was on the jersey it is john Tavares, world junior legend (laughs) john Tavares. you know what i actually uh decided like because my sister got me this for my uh christmas gift um and uh i was we were like at, at the time when they were the real juniors yeah we were watching all the highlights of like john Tavares the um, 2009 and it was just crazy where it's just i remember that canada game against the u.s where canada went down like 3-0 in the first period ended yep. up winning it and just john Tavares had a hat trick and it, it's weird it's like i always loved him at the time for that but as like leafs captain i've just like i never i don't know why i didn't connect it in a way yeah no that's right i assumed that jersey was going to be nick ritchie yeah you and adam both is that fair, that. <laughs> is, that fair? is that fair probably like okay if i'll see how the off season goes <laughs> everything goes well with nick ritchie i'll maybe get him if he's nick still ritchie a leaf jersey. if he's still yeah. a leaf um okay let's there's a few stories, not great stories, but I think they deserve the attention. Mm-hmm. So I want to get them right off the bat so we don't lose, uh, we don't go too long. Um, this is the first one reported. Uh, of course, it was Rick Westhead who reported it because who else is reporting on these type of stories in the NHL? But two lawyer, uh, two lawyers, two referees uh, filed a lawsuit for wrongful termination. Uh, they were fired back in... On February 27, 2020, uh, this is, these two officials' names are David Wachowiak and James Watkins. Uh, Watkins had been working with the NHL since 1998, and Wachowiak was hired in September 2005. Now, they were fired. So during their tenure with the NHL, the two officials alleged that their colleague, Pat DiLorenzo Jr. repeatedly used racist racist language at work. Uh, This is a quote from the lawsuit. DiLorenzo made negative racial comments about NHL employees, including but not limited to uh, NHL's African-American hockey players and 
the African-American veteran Sonia Bryson Kirksey, who sings the national anthem uh, at Tampa Bay Lightning Games at Amelie Arena. So both these referees had reported the incident to Ron Brace, who is the NHL's former chief crew chief in Tampa. And they allege that Brace failed to take any action for several years. Uh, the lawsuit says that it was reported to them in November and December in 2019. Uh, the racial comments were so offensive and so pervasive that one of the, one of the refs began recording De Lorenzo's racial comments at work, Brace told TSN in an interview in November 2020 that he never heard De Lorenzo using racist language. And there's a more, recording now, <laughs> and there's a recording, so there's more to yeah. it. But just this already, it it's just damning. Like what what was your initial reaction? Because it's been a few days since this came out. What was your initial reaction since this came out? Um, for me, it's just, I don't know, like, uh, I think like the way the NHL is going to paint this is that it's an isolated situation and we're going to have to deal with it. But for me, it's just another example of, okay, this, this is something that's, that's there. And I think that the way Rick has Rick Westwood, Rick Westhead has been able to kind of explore these stories. And I think that there's a bit more of openness towards addressing these things in the game that like like unfortunately i'm not surprised that there's something like this coming out and i think the way this investigation went and i think that that was the crucial point for me in the article was that things started to get recorded yeah is a perfect example of and i'm not gonna say again like the nhl saying like oh it's their word versus another person's word but if there's something there already, it's a concrete piece of evidence, then I think that's something that the NHL really has to look into more extensively. And they're yeah. NHL employees, no, not just team employees. Yeah, and and uh, Rick West had tweet, also tweeted that the plaintiffs allege that after the NHL was provided with six recordings of a league employee using racist language, NHL attorney Kate Watson, instru- quote, instructed that the video recordings be destroyed. Okay. Like it just it, yeah, it's like, not a good look. Like it, in reality this is not a good look for the league and uh and they had a discussion on SDP and I want to get to one question that was asked but it's just how I keep saying this but like the last 18 months have been extremely extremely poor PR for the NHL from one story to the next, to the next, to the next, and and to now this. And it just feels like, I don't know, like this isn't something that happened 10 years ago. You know what I mean? Like, no, and I, I'm not saying that that changes in anything, but you know how p- some people on the internet like to use that argument that, well, you know, this happened X amount of years ago. This was recently. Mm-hmm. This was it's t- the beginning of 2020. This was in the er- late 2019, early 2020. Like this is recent. And I say it again, and you, you mentioned it too. It's hard to tr- like trust this group of leadership in terms of doing the right thing. And again, this proves it to me, at least. Yeah, I it's it's an uncomfortable situation now where I, I the one I kind of felt was like, did the league not learn from the other situations going on that if you try to bury things when they're already out in the media, it's just gonna it's gonna look even worse. Um I hate always doing this, but I look at other leagues sometimes where these certain things are getting addressed. I know nothing is perfect right now, but especially when it comes to like sexual or domestic assault and baseball, like they've been very, very strict with those cases or even with basketball where, you know, listen, like they said, this, there's these things that are going on in the world that we can't just ignore it and just play the game that everything is so interconnected right now that you can't just, just say like, okay, well, those things are going on in the outside world, but let's just focus on what's going on in the arena. And I think that, when people say like, you know, the game is not like it was anymore. 
it, it isn't. It's it is changing. There's a lot of things that are changing, but these are perfect examples of okay. There's systemic problems going on right now. There's things like this that are going on, and it's like we don't know any of the details yet. Everything is alleged right now, but you know, if there's enough information for Rick Westhead to report on, then like I'm I'm pretty concerned. Yeah, like it's just so concerning like this is and it's unfortunate that it's unfortunate that like it's not really being talked about again like remember when when all the kyle what led up to the kyle beach interview who was talking about it like Like, he said four reporters yeah include rick westhead included and katie strang and um Scott Lazarus and Mark Powers and obviously some local Chicago reporters. But it's like, again, this is a damning story. What, and I understand right now it's, a, it's, it's an allegation and it's a lawsuit. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't be reporting on it. Like, I think this is a this is a huge, huge deal. Like, in my opinion, like, I, I, I don't know. I, I think you would agree with me, too. Like. This isn't something to be to be kind of thrown under the rug from the media's perspective. Like, not it shouldn't be thrown under the rug from the league's perspective. But again, it doesn't surprise us that they would do something allegedly do something like that. But from the media's perspective, when it's their job to report things like this, yet it's one guy doing it or a group of people doing it every single time, it's disheartening like from from the outside and from the outside it's just so disheartening to watch yeah when I, mean, I don't know it's just it for things to like grow for things to get better like you have to kind of look at the ugliness of things and i'm not i'm not dissuading any of the other articles that are going on but there are so much more emphasis when, and I think this isn't a great thing. Like, this is what I like about hockey is that when there's like a certain emphasis on, for example, like a charity or like, you know, good guy report, for example. Yeah. Kind of thing. Like that, those are amazing stories. Those are things that I think something hockey is doing really well, even like, you know, whatever league you go to. And I like that those get shared a lot on social media. Like I see how many players, how many teams share those kind of things, but at the same time, the important concrete stories are also there. And even if it is not the nicest or kindest stories you want to read, it's not a feel good story. It's still there. It's still, it's still the truth you have to look at. And it's still like the information that readers and fans have to know about. A hundred percent. Yeah. Like I don't think you, you said it perfectly there. Um, they, they brought this up. Obviously they had a lengthy discussion about this on the Steve Dangle podcast. And Steve asked an important question that I think a lot of people should be thinking about. And it was, what would make you trust the NHL? Like, what would they have to do as an organization to regain your trust? And and I don't, like, personally, I do not trust them with many things. Like, uh, are you the same way or are you thinking differently? I think it's it is different because it's the same thing that we've been talking about before. It's what I've looked at for other teams as well. I think it's just it's the built up idea within the team where like you you keep your head down and you know are you a team player, and that that works well if it's a well run management team. But I think sometimes when it is really closed off like that, I think. I don't, I don't like saying it all is because I know it's not their obligation. They're not paid to do this, but other leagues have been able to do this because they have the personalities that speak out that they, they have enough like clout on their own right. to kind of like to spearhead this. And then through that one change, it affects everything else in the league. Right. But I just don't think the NHL is there right now where I think that there's an idea that they're like, we have to kind of keep up in certain ways. And I bring this up all the time where you'll have LeBron James, for example, say a speech about, you know, systematic racism. 
But then with the NHL, at like what the intermissions, it just says on the uh, jumbotron and racism. Right. I think like for me, that's the biggest example of things where the league wants to say, "Hey, we're also with the other sports world. We're doing these things, but we just don't have the same spokespersons, or we just we're just not there yet in terms of wanting to see what is the ugliness of this of the sport." So, if I'm understanding this right, you you would say that. What the NHL doing is doing now is more performative rather than what other leagues are doing is they're act because they have the personalities to do so are actually taking action. Is that fair? Would that be a fair thing to say? Yeah, I think it's just it's more of like we it's it's like it's not a lot of inward perspective in a way. Okay. Because I think with the NHL and I'm not just saying like, you know, there's, there has been some change like you know, we see like the hockey diversity Alliance, but it's more of, and I know like the NHL is not partnering, not, with them. not yeah. working with the NHL. Yeah. But I think for me, it's more of, and you know, I could be wrong about this opinion, but I just feel like with hockey, it's like they're preserving, they're preserving what they think hockey is, how, how you should view the sport. And the, it's still being brought forward like that. Like, you know, just keep your head down. Um, you know, are you in it for the team? Like, you know, it's all about the on ice performance. Let's keep things in the locker room. Let's not, let's not talk about things. And I think it, it is an outdated, is an outdated concept and hockey is staying right there. But I think that when we talk about the old time fans, right. Um, and again, really good. like again, this is just my opinion. Like, I think with the old time fans, like they're not the people who are driving everything on the internet anymore. They're not everyone who's that, who's there. That's gonna gonna be like the the biggest, I guess, like make the biggest percentage of the fan base right now. But I think like there's still that idea of like what makes a hockey fan, and it's it's like you're tuning out like, like their idea is like, you have to tune out everything else that's going on around here. It's like, just focus on what's going on in the rink. I think to add to that, the NHL is so worried about losing parts of an original fan base that they're unwilling to even try to, to grow their fan base. They're so stuck in their ways in terms of this is the tar- this is our target audience, and that's the only target audience we have. We don't we're not going to touch these. We're not going to try to attract this these fans. If they come, they come. If they don't, they don't. And I just don't think that's the right mentality for them to have as a business. Like you know, everyone loves to bring up the business of the game, and we talk about it plenty on the podcast. I, I don't see how in what world that is good for business. Like you have it right now where it's, yes, valuations of teams are going up, but you're still like, and I, I, I don't know if you saw this tweet going around. I don't remember who it was from, but it was about what's like your goofy sports take. Oh yeah, I saw, saw that. that yeah, yeah. So I'm, and this I don't know if this is goofy or not, but like I legitimately believe that within like five years, the MLS will be bigger than the NHL because the MLS is working towards growing their league in terms of in in multiple areas, skill, like in every area imaginable. But the, imaginable, but the NHL is so stuck in their ways that they're still trying to market to the same fans. And when they do market out to different fan bases, they're not doing a great job at it because they're still using the same ways. Like they, they haven't adapted. They, they've stayed the same in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and that's funny when you brought up the goofy sports take, because yeah. there's been so many, um, I guess, variations of that throughout the years I've seen and I will link it to here when I can find it again, but there's been so many different ones where it's like ranked the top five sports in, I think they put in America and like the United States. And I think like, you know, the traditional ones were there, like, you know, football, baseball, basketball. And then before the NHL, I think there was like Pokemon. No. 
and like for esports and then there's also i think like they said like after net they put in brackets after netflix um they put formula one and then like i think hockey was like eighth or ninth on that that, list and that doesn't even include like call it like college basketball and college football are included within football and basketball if you like ranked it by leagues I i think by far the nhl is in terms of professional sports, yes, they are number four at the moment. But if you include college sports, I I don't think like they're not in the top five. I don't think. No, they're not. Yeah, like, and <laughs> it just there's like other examples too where um, I had this conversation last year where people were huge, huge fans of these esports players, right? Yeah. But at the same time, like if you're not in Canada, like I remember uh, there was one segment where they asked like, oh, who's Connor McDavid? And they didn't know. But they knew like the esports guy because in terms of like the ranking, in terms of, I guess, like the revenue for that. Uh, that is that is rough. Uh, knowing that the next face of the league, if not the current face of the league, no one really knows. That is uh, that is rough. Uh, is there anything else? Because I this is obviously a developing story. I, this feels like a story that can develop similar to past stories that Rick West said is done. Is there anything else before we move on? Yeah, for sure. I think for me, it's just one last thing is I, as we keep following this story, I want to know more about the recordings. Like, I know that's not going to be released anytime soon as the case goes on, but I, it's just interesting for me to see how that plays a role in this case. And, you know, again, we're none of us are legal experts, right? but for me, like when I first read that, it's just, it's so concrete that that cannot de- be dismissed. Right. Uh, for sure. S- moving from one, not great story to another, like this is uh, as Adam, yeah, it's the way that we, here, is, it's just know. a rough, it's, it's a rough way to transition, but I'm assuming you've seen the story about Reed Boucher, uh, come alight recently. He's obviously, this is from markerzone.com. Uh, Reed Boucher, who's currently playing in the KHL, uh, has pleaded guilty to the sexual assault of a minor while with a billet family in the state of Michigan back in 2011. Uh, Boucher, now 28, would have been 17 years old at the time and a member of the USA Hockey National Team Development Program. Um, the the victim in this case, I, there is no name at the moment, but she was 12 at the time, which is, I, I don't know. I don't know how to react to that. Like, that's obviously horrible. I just don't know how to put it uh, in words at the moment. I'm just going to pull this up here. Uh, the vic- This is from Rick, Rick Westhead. The victim told friends in 2011 about the assault and a friend's parents contacted USA Hockey. Uh, according to a police report, uh, Boucher was removed by USA Hockey from his bill at home, uh, and then he would play for the U.S. in the U18 Worlds uh, weeks later. Okay, so I think there was one. I think it was from the Detroit or the Detroit uh, newspaper. I think they're the yeah. first ones to report on this. Um, unfortunately, it was under through a paywall. And, but other yes. articles, like the one you've mentioned, were able to access prior to this episode. And I think there was one comment that was there about the headline about how he was allowed to play. And then the first things you talk, they say is like he won the KHL equivalent of a Stanley Cup. And I really didn't like how they added that. Just, just write the story on like what is the main idea of this. And it is the sexual assault. Um, and it's just weird for me because like when they wrote about in the article, how all of these things were going on and he was still able to have a, like this privilege yeah. going on. And for me, like, I didn't know this was going on, but I just remember 2012, 2013 seasons where this guy was highly touted out of the starting this thing. Right. I remember Lou Lamorello when he was with the New Jersey devils was talking about how this guy was a steal in the draft, how, I believe he had more than like 60 goals in 68 games in the OHL. And he was projected to be a top six forward moving forward for the devils. And then he was afforded all these opportunities along the way. And then for me, I guess when I was a young fan then, and then looking at this now, just thinking like all this stuff was going on and this guy was just being viewed as a highly touted prospect that you just have to watch. Yeah. It's, it's so 
disheartening and and similar to you know we talked about it with Kyle Beach we talked about it uh with Logan Mayo and we talked about it with Mitchell Miller like imagine from the victim's perspective for years get it or in this case with Reed Boucher years and years and getting away with nothing and now he's now he gets like he won't get jail time and it yeah, won't, like if he completes his yeah. sentence he won't it won't be on his record it's like it just doesn't feel it just it, it hurts it hurts from in, in that standpoint a lot like it's, it's disgusting because the big thing with that like the situation is that it's not like the second time it was, it was willful blindness right he knew what he was doing and he blackmailed his victim yeah. it's not just kind of like oh you know he was too young to really understand he was already 17 and he doubled down on the crime yeah no so it's it just it's it's complicated it's just for me i know that more details again are going to come up with this this legal case but yeah it's just it was weird for me to reading because like looking back where like obviously a lou lamorello type i'm not blaming lamorello but i'm more, saying like a guy like yeah. lou lamorello or the hockey world knew like if when you're gonna analyze a prospect like this, you know how these other things were going on. So well, I, I don't know if you saw the quotes from Katie Strang. Uh Lou Lou Lamorello did talk to or answered questions from Katie Strang and uh she asked if he was aware of the sexual assault referenced in the Detroit Free Press. And Lou uh said unequivocally, our organization did not know about this incident. Obviously, he was the team, as you said, that drafted uh that drafted him and then all when he was asked if he would have been drafted if he would have been drafted had he known about the incident lou said no it's just like it's hard to it's hard to believe that not like it's hard to believe that he they didn't know knowing knowing like the way Lou runs an organization for in terms of like, from what I know, and I'm not an expert on Lou Lamorello. I mean, I'm not trying to be an expert. It's just hard to believe that he wouldn't have known something like this. Like it's so blatantly bad. Yeah. Because like, I think we've mentioned first round picks, but we also mentioned even later in the drafts, like, I guess like the stock you put in, like the amount of scouting you put into a prospect, no matter where they go in the draft, you know, there was work to be done there. So there is due diligence when you make a pick. So I don't know. It's okay. Like, you know, we don't know, like, cause I'm, I don't want to blame Lou Amarello. Like it's either he did not know, like, you know, the develop the U S national development program, maybe just didn't write it down or anything, but I just, I don't, that's, it's a big enough thing that he moved billet families that, if I'm a scout, I'd be like, okay, why was that the case? Right. Like, I don't necessarily think that's a normal thing. And, and I think the discussion here, like, I think the discussion we can have here can be revolved around, like, I I think teams, obviously when he was drafted, this was 11 years ago. And, and it doesn't change the fact that they should have done their due due diligence back then. But I think what we've seen in the last, again, two years or so is that teams now should be doing their due diligence. Teams should have been doing their due diligence, but now as we like, as things change, I think teams should be doing their due diligence on that. Like that is, I, again, like I was said, I was speechless. Like that's just a horrible, horrible, horrible story. Like mm-hmm. brutal. Uh, and it's just tough to believe that they did either. He, Lou didn't know about it. Like, and he, USA hockey did not say anything about it, which then again, scum of the earth, USA hockey right there. But like, just, Something went wrong and they're like, how did this go under the radar is what I want to know. I think that's the question that needs to be answered is how, how did this go under the radar for, especially when he got drafted? Yeah. Especially that, or even, Um, I don't know. It just, because I was looking back on his stats, like there's one last thing I have on this. It's just 
like he was allowed to excel despite what was going on. Like I know he didn't really become a full time NHL or like he had a bit of promise here when he went with the Devils, but it just they, they he was afforded every opportunity to excel. Yeah, no, like that, like nothing happened. Exactly, which is like exactly. Does it surprise you? Not really. It yeah, it doesn't su- surprise me either. Um, again, rough transition, but. We got to do it. We, we, I think we briefly mentioned it last episode, but it, it literally had just come out uh, as we were recording. Connor McDavid spoke out yesterday or a couple, few days ago. Uh, oh, it's twice in a week. Wow. <laughs> twice in, in, in a week. He had some interesting things to say. Obviously, uh, it's about the Evander Kane situation. By the way, a couple things. Uh, the teams are waiting for some type of clarity in terms of the contract situation uh, and the NHL and the Canadian border services are running investigations. There's no timeline set for uh, the NHL investigation, but he's going to be signed. Yeah. He, he's, he's going to be signed by a team. What, what Connor McDavid did say yesterday, this was about, uh, Vander Kane potentially joining the Oilers was if fans don't like it or the media doesn't like it or whatever, it is what it is. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Like it just, it kind of felt defensive. Like you, I, I don't know if that was just me. It just, it, it felt very like, def- like he was trying to defend something that he's, that he's that like, that's not a great locker room right now. I think for me, it's just, it's what I've mentioned before, where you look at the personalities and the franchise guys of other leagues. And I, again, I keep comparing the league, but I think it's just Connor McDavid, he's just not used to being on the spot like this. Um, he's yeah. not, he's not, and I know he's younger, but I'm like, he's not used to having these types of questions thrown at him. Like, we know that like they're used to the interviews, like they had it, like everything go on the ice. I think when you start to dig a bit more, it's like, all right. So, you know, once you leave the ice, how's the locker room, how's things going? Um, do you have enough scoring, like uh, secondary scoring on your team? Like what needs to happen? And I think that what you said last episode was great. Like on the ice performance. Yes. A player like Evander Kane is who also happens to play wing is someone Connor McDavid or Leon Dreisaitl needs. But in terms of everything else where it does, aff- like, I think that's the bigger thing. It affects everything else. Everything else aside from the on-ice performance, how is that going to affect everything? And I think that it's weird. It's like we've mentioned Evander Kane when he first went to San Jose. You know, you had Patrick Marlowe, you had Joe Thornton, you had Brent Burns, you had Mark Edward Vlasic. All these guys, and then you had Eric Carlson. Like, you think these types of this type of leadership group was gonna was gonna let Evander Kane do what he wanted to do, like in Buffalo or in Winnipeg? I know things got a lot more worse with it, but I think about that where these things still were brought up in San Jose when you have that leadership group there, and then you go to Edmonton now, where we don't know where the stability is. We don't know how things are going on and it is pretty tense in there. Like he, I don't know. You, you don't bring in an Evander Kane in this situation where you try to make things better. It just, I feel like, okay. So, you know, in EA games where you try, you know, the, in the EA game where you try to put, you know, like, okay, we need some better scoring. And then yeah. like the team, like the lead, the, you know, how on the lines, it's like minus one. Yeah. You put Evander Kane, I think like minus five. <laughs> Like, well, I, I think you make a fair point because, you know, a lot of people uh, from what I've seen, uh, obviously, there's different sides uh, to this. There's the people who are saying he absolutely should not sign um, or play in this league ever again. And there's obviously the side that says he's good. He's a good hockey player. He should sign. But what I don't think one that we're talking about is when it, you put Evander Kane in this locker room, right? Who, which is clearly, clearly fractured at the moment. Like they look exhausted 
every time I see an Edmonton Oiler player uh, in front of a camera, they look exhausted. So there's clear, and, and it probably has something to do with the fact that they're not playing great right now. So you put a guy like Evander Kane in the locker room and, you know, okay, it boosts morale for, for a bit, right? Because he's, he's good. He's good. Like it's, you look at the statistics, he is a good hockey player, but what happens when he screws up? Not on the ice. I mean, off the ice. Because, like, what happens when he screws up? That, what happens to that locker room? It gets fractured again. And now you're in the same spot you were in earlier. So, in, and because Ken Holland doesn't want to trade, like, to me, and, and I don't know if you'd agree with this, but based off of Ken Holland's press conference, his move is a Vander Kane. Yeah, like that's it. He he doesn't want to trade a first. He doesn't want to trade top prospects. And like, okay, so what's your move? Like, and and I don't mean obviously we had the discussion about trading for rentals. I'm not saying trade a first round pick and a top prospect for rental, but Jacob Tricker is available. Not that he's the solution, but at least you have him for a few more years. One it's, thing, um, yeah. oh, sorry, go on. No, no, go, go ahead. One thing I just kind of felt with Evander Kane is San Jose, you know, when they're winning, it's a great market, but it's not the biggest, one of the biggest markets. But at the same time, we still got all these headlines and all these details on Evander Kane's life. Can you imagine when he goes to Edmonton? Connor McDavid, like, I, I, from his perspective, I'm like, he doesn't like answering these questions. If Evander Kane is in Edmonton, he's under a microscope. He's under more of a microscope than he was in Winnipeg. Yeah. No offense to Winnipeg. It's just the way the Edmonton media is. It's quite similar to the way it is in Toronto and the way it is to it in Montreal, just to a different, maybe not necessarily as big an extent, but the microscope is going to be on Evander Kane. And if he makes a mistake off the ice, it's, it's going to be messy. That's what happened. Like, it seems like what happened in San Jose, like, yes, San Jose was not a great team to, to begin with, unfortunately, but it didn't help that there was a lot of off ice distractions for Vander Kane and not in, not an off ice distraction and, you know, going and doing an ad and going and doing a, a, like a feature story, like an actual distraction. Like those aren't distractions. People want to make them out to be distractions because that's hockey, but that's not an actual distraction. These stories continually coming out in the in the media for Evander Kane are distractions, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, I- I'm curious to get your take back to just quickly end this about McDavid. Like, were you surprised that McDavid, like, that's what McDavid believes um yes and not really i think it's just for me like i was surprised because of how young he is and <clears throat> i think he was like i guess like the way he, like yeah how young he is and where he was drafted um there's a bit more openness to say like okay you speak your mind a bit more because that is a uh, very uh it's a very like, you know, like you just kind of slate over everything where he, he pinpointed the fans and media, everything. It's like, it is what it is. Okay. What, what does that mean? Like it is literally something you just say and you could leave and you're like, Hey, listen, we didn't get anywhere <laughs> with what you were talking about. Um, And I think there's that, but there is that like degree of frustration there that he, he is under that microscope now or, and he's under that amount of like pressure to like, kind of speak for like, okay, what's going on with the team? Like you just lost to Ottawa. What's going on in the locker room? Like um, what happened to like all of these, you know, moves you did in the off season, like why are they not paying off? And now you want to get Evander Kane. And I'm not surprised because it's what I've said before in this episode is that I think the NHL is just not there yet in terms of the personalities or the guys who you could look towards to say that, you know, change is coming and like positive change is coming. 
Yeah, no, I, I think you make a good point. There. Like for me, I, I wasn't surprised that's what he believes. Like that's just what we've been kind of accustomed to in terms of uh, hockey players overall, uh, uh, for the most part. I was surprised that he actually said it out loud. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, uh, while we do say hockey players don't necessarily sh- don't have personality, that doesn't mean they're stupid or they're not smart, like media wise. Remember, these guys get media training, right? Yeah. And that's why they say the same things about a hundred times. But for Connor McDavid to outright say it like that caught me off guard because it's not something normally we would see in recently. Like I don't remember the last time someone said something like that. So pretty much uh, blatantly. I just remember Phil Kessel where he's like, we're trying. <laughs> we're really yeah, trying. That was, <laughs> Phil Kessel in Toronto was like, I don't, it was just such a, <laughs> a such a mess. Uh as you know, from what mess of a situation to I don't know what on earth this article was. Uh, did I, I know we talked about it? John Chaco wrote an article in Sportico for some reason. For some reason, can uh, you you had something you said before we started recording? I, I want you to repeat. Yeah, definitely. Like when I was reading it, um, like it, for me, it came out of nowhere. I'm like, oh, okay, I decided to write a his own opinion piece, his own feature. Let me, let me like, I want the details. And he kind of just like kept building up to something that never actually came. That there were so many things saying about, Oh, you know, leadership is hard and that's okay. And um, these are how the things go. Here's my experience with everything. And then it's like, okay, all right, just tell us how you really feel, John. And the article just kind of ends. I yeah, I feel like I didn't get anything, to be honest. Like I, I just felt it was in a way it, it was felt kind of dull because like, okay, you know, it, it's kind of as you said, like it's the start of like this really nice feature piece that's absolutely just gonna he's gonna unload everything that happened with the coyotes. And it starts with, you know, him being a leader. And it's like I only got about him being a leader. I didn't get everything else. Like In a way, to me, it felt as if this was his like, okay, I'm ready to come back. It was that dull that the NHL, uh, the owners and executives ate that up. Yeah, I I, I I don't know if that was just me. Because the first few parts were like, all right, he's going to really dig into the um, Coyotes. You know, um, that idea of like two guys are about to have a fist fight Mm -hmm. and then they keep just circling each other but they don't actually like do anything like until yeah. like, you know, like when the crowd goes around them it, and then it, like, yeah. and then like they, the guy's like, okay, why don't I take the first hit or like take the first hit. And then like, people are like, okay, they're not going to do anything. Just like disperse. I kind of felt like it was like with this article where I, it started off like, okay, like what are the details he's going to tell us about? Because I've been waiting for this perspective for so long. Like he kind of just, had these really empty statements and then he confirmed that he was talking to another team. And then that was the main thing people were kind of focusing on. Not really like, not, under, not really on like before he went, do you remember like the, the amount of trades and signings he did to try to get the coyotes to somewhere? I wanted to know more about that where it just, that kind of went off his path about the whole analytics thing where, you know, we're going to have these guys set here and, we're going to see how things go. Like suddenly he's getting all these guys like a Taylor Hall, a Phil Kessel. And I don't know. We never got any closure with this. And I don't think we will because it's the NHL. But for me, it's just, it's just kind of like here now where I'm looking at it more, how you said it, where it's that appeal to management saying like, he still wants to work in hockey, but there is still a bit of a semblance saying like, Hey, this was what the case was when I was in the coyotes. Yeah. Cause he didn't throw anybody under the bus. I, I, when I read that article, I didn't think he threw anybody under the bus uh, within the NHL. But what I did feel like he did was he's like, you know, I've learned from my mistakes, you know, you know, I know I got suspended for a year and I lost the coyotes, a first and a second round pick because of 
draft shenanigans, but I've learned from my mistakes and, you know, I'm ready to come back into the NHL. Like I just, I read it about three times and I'm like, I don't know what he, he was trying to get across in this article. Me, me as well. Cause it's crazy to look back. I'm like Barrett Hayden technically cost them two first round picks in a third. If like we're thinking back on that draft combine where it's like he was probably the guy they were doing this for. Yeah. Just you know, we don't know for sure. We're just thinking about that. But yeah, I don't know. Like he, I think yeah, he's inching to come back, and he just I don't know. He could have done it a different way. I think. Um, I think it would have been nice if he actually spoke out and then an article afterwards comes out because I don't know, like it's, it, it felt kind of flat for me. Oh, it was very, it was like the flattest article. Yeah. It, could have, it could have been like, there was just no substance to it. It's like, okay, I'm still working at Wendy's. If It's like if the NHL, if, Hey, NHL, if you guys don't want me, I'll just uh, be running my 13 Wendy's locations. It's yeah. Like a, okay, okay. Cool. <laughs> it's like awesome. Thanks. Thanks for letting us know. Um, you, you mentioned getting back into the game. You know who else wants to get back into the game? Triple H. <laughs> no. no. Quebec okay. City. Yes. Um, I only bring this up because I want to get one thing across. So obviously, we've heard for a couple months now that the. Quebec wants to promote the game of hockey, essentially in terms of getting more uh, French Canadian players and developing them. Um, So last week, Bill Daly, Gary Bettman sat down with, I believe the finance minister in Quebec and essentially nothing very much happened in that meeting. They said, okay, we're not, we don't really want to come here right now, but we're going to keep the lines of communications open. I'm not surprised. I cannot remember. It was someone on TSN who has mentioned it, where um, they said about the Quebec premiers, like, this is not how you get an NHL team because there's too much attention to it and the NHL doesn't like that. And um, I was kind of laughing about that because. It's like we always think about like what are the most obvious markets that a team can go back to or a team can get, and then <clears throat> the NHL's like, okay, we hear you, but here's Seattle. Yeah, like um, it's just an example of that where it is weird. We're like, you have to kind of know how to maneuver around these things, and then I, I, I wish I remember who it was, but it was on TSN where they mentioned like this is not how you go about these things because the NHL doesn't like that they're being you know quote unquote you know pestered on um like on social media um uh through the media on everything that hey why not have a team here and i think what we said before like about the whole closed door negotiations with things i think a lot of these meetings more have to do with hey we're looking at it as a possibility so we don't get anyone mad if we actually come back later on but we still are not gonna be conclusive with anything because we just don't like the attention yeah, I, I think that's that's a possibility. I, I, for me, I look at what's going on and from both sides, I'm just begging them to stop bringing this up because the NHL obviously does not want to go back to Quebec City. Like they couldn't be more obvious about it. They really couldn't. And it's like, I feel like they're only approaching these meetings, like you said, because they just keep getting asked about it and it just keeps coming up. Um, and it's always on so it's on social media, but from Quebec's perspective, and not from not from the people. I mean, from the government. I don't like. I, I really think this is a political ploy. Like, obviously, I think there's uh, provincial elections in Quebec next year, and it just feels like they're using that as a ploy to build up some type of happiness because things in Quebec aren't always they're really very, bad. They're not great. Um, yeah, I so, wish them the best with COVID, by the way. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, um, it, just please stop. Please, please go back. Stop. Okay, I have a theory. And okay. I hope like when Adam comes uh, back to the next episode that he could probably talk more on this because he was here during the finals. He was there during the finals run. Right. 
for the Montreal Canadiens. Is there like just like a euphoria here? It's like there was a return to idea of like, look at how everything in Quebec kind of, and I, you know, I, I, I don't know this because we were here, but like just looking for what happened in Montreal and like the, I guess, suburban areas around it as well, that there was that return to like, oh my gosh, look at this. This is amazing. Look at how everyone's excited about this. Did that, I guess, spark the, the idea again where it's like, hey, we can do that again with the Nordiques. Like, because I, I recall like in 1994, 1995, before they were sold, they made the playoffs. Like, you know, before they got Patrick Waz, a Colorado out of Avalanche, like you imagine having like Joe Sackett <laughs> on your team, Peter yeah. Forsberg on your team. Like, and like, I think this was before they traded for Matt, they traded Matt Sundin and then they had Owen Nolan. And like, could they try something? No, I mean, they could have tried something. They feel, I, I, I think at the time they just didn't feel obviously that it was as profitable as, you know, I guess moving it to somewhere else. Like, and like again, Arizona? like, I, 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 the, yeah, I know, <laughs> yeah. I know, I don't agree with it, Daniel. I don't agree with it. But again, like, I think they're in that same situation where they feel like they could go to other markets and be more profitable. And I guess I don't know the, financial side of it that could that's probably up for debate but it's like please can we both know i think all three of us could very much agree that the nhl does not want to go to quebec city like they yeah, couldn't right they don't so why is this still being to me it's like why is this still being a conversation under gary bettman like we know he pers- like that this management group is not going to go back. Once Gary Bettman is gone, let's revisit that idea because I think then we have something there. But under a management group who wants to wants nothing to do with Quebec City, I just I feel like we are playing the they're playing with the fans. Yeah, I have this like I have this funny idea that's going to happen where people are like, we should get another team back in Canada, and then eventually Gary's going to say yes to it, and then everyone's like, okay, the Nordiques are coming back, and then he's going to come out and say the Victoria Millionaires are coming back, guys. That's what you wanted, right? Sorry, yeah, I was drinking water. Yeah, no, that's exactly what I wanted. I want yeah. a team in Victoria, BC, <laughs> right now. Like, no, I just, it's just, he uh, clearly has a thing against Canada. He's so invested in growing the game in the U.S. that every time we talk about growing the game in Canada, it just feels like we're, we're playing with our own hearts. Cause it's like, think no, so. they're not going to do anything. They obviously like, they don't care. I don't, I wanted, I don't think they care. One thing I always wanted to ask last year was, what was Gary Bettman's opinion on the Colorado Avalanche retro reverse? Oh, was it? Because it was it was the Nordiques. Nordiques. Oh, I'm sure he loved it. Really? It's like, oh yes, see, sarcastically, forever, forever in the yeah. U.S. Yeah, exactly. He's like, I'm still making money off the Quebec, uh, off of Quebec, but they don't have to be there for me to make money off of it. That's I'm imagining his uh, thought process, <laughs> like brutal, brutal. Um, so a couple of, unless you have anything else to say, moving off uh, Quebec, um, but there are a couple notes about the Olympics so far. So number one, we now know who will be leading Team Canada at the Olympics. It is mm. Shane Doan, former Arizona Coyote, and uh, Claude Julian. He's back. He's back. Former from Spangler coach. Cup, from Spangler Cup to the <laughs> Olympics. But uh, we're, we're, I think we were still clear or Adam was like, yeah, like they should definitely bring him back. Montreal should bring him back. I guess not for some time, but no. we will, we will see. Uh, and you know who else I noticed here? Jeremy Culloden is going to be an assistant. No. Yeah, okay. I'm happy for that. Um, For him, for that, because like he <laughs> was given an about. impossible task in Chicago and they kind of just dismissed him like that. So I'm happy to see that he got another job. Yeah. Um. Again, like we, I think it's going to be a weird. I think is I'm more. Ex- I know no NHL players, but I'm excited about this Olympics more than 2018. Um. I think. I believe Claude Julien has a gold medal. I think it was with 2010. 
Um, could search that up. I know yeah. that like Shane Doan. Um, I know he played the Olympics as well. So I think you know it's a solid management team, and I'm excited in the next week or two to see how the lines are going to be. Um, I keep laughing at that fake list for Canada. That was that was happening where um, I believe Mark Mathot retweeted where he's like, "Oh, thanks guys for uh, saying congrats for making the Olympic team." <laughs> And um, it was just hilarious to me. Like Fred Brathwaite was listed. He's a goalie coach right now. He was listed as the third goalie and he's like 51 years old. Oh my God. I and saw then, there was a couple of names that popped out to me. Uh, Joffrey Lupel and Dion Vidoff. I know. And Danny Heatley. I'm like, wow. Oh, wow. Wow. So, uh, sorry. Uh, Claude Julian won a gold medal as an assistant in 2014. 2014. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Chindon won 2002. Well, did he make the team? I know he was 2006, but I don't know if he was 2002. I will search that up real quick. Um, uh, oh, come on. Give me something. I will find out. But uh, let's let's move on to a different country right now. Uh, team USA has released their roster. And it's Are you a excited? bit of, yeah, yeah, I'm I'm excited to see a couple of players. Um, but it was a mix. Like this, so this was something that was kind of talked about, uh, and now is probably going to happen for Canada as well. But they're bringing a mix of very, very young guys and some experienced guys. Uh, obviously, you know, Maddie Beniers is going. I believe Seattle prospect Sean Farrell, Montreal prospect, and then uh, Nick Abruzzese. I can't get over that name. That's hilarious. And Matthew Nyes are uh, are Leaf prospects. I know uh, Jake Sanderson. That's who I'm yes. missing. Jake Sanderson, uh, Senators prospect. What do you think about the the um, Olympic teams taking some of the younger guys? I actually really like it because we saw that there was a lot of enthusiasm with it already i remember in the last olympics there was a bit of hesitation to do this where the u.s team just brought in troy terry to the team and i thought that was a huge boost for his development and right now you'll see you know potentially with the u.s team right now the 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 higher number of ncaa guys who want to go who want to play for this i think it's a good throwback to how it was in the nineties where, and this, I just know this from reading and not from watching it, but just there was more of that emphasis before NHL players went to these highly touted university prospects who were top five picks or, you know, somewhere in the draft that they're going to be able to play on a huge stage like this. And I think that for a lot of guys too, just the way the world juniors went this year, I think it's amazing that a lot of the other guys, because even if you look at the goaltending, like, two out of the three of the guys were on the real junior team. Right. And it, it is nice to see that. I think the U S teams bring a bit more of a balanced team right now. They're bringing a lot of guys who have really excelled in their um, junior or their senior years of university. So I'm excited for that. I think the one thing I kind of had with this team is the goaltending because I'm trying to think like who were like former I don't think they have it anymore, like USA standout guys they could have brought in instead of like just the young guys. Um, it's like Ryan Miller retired. Um, Ryan Miller retired, yeah. I'm like, who, who are they? Like, I mean, Craig Anderson's in the NHL still. Yeah, he, and he's injured. He's month to month, which is brutal. Uh, I, I don't know. I can't think of them off the top of my head. Because I think with Canada, every time we mention it, or like other teams, it's like, hey, do you remember this guy playing NHL like five years ago? He's your starter for your country. <laughs> like, I I don't know for the U.S. It's a it's a different approach. Obviously, if we had NHL players going, like I don't think um, any of these guys are going to the Olympics. Like, it's just I I don't I don't think so. Um, so it'll be cool. It'll definitely be cool to see see these guys, these younger guys. Like it's obviously yes, it's cool. I get to see Nick Shore play again. But and like I think Marley's me, legend, Kenny Agostino. <laughs> yeah, Ken Marley's legend, Kenny Agostino. Like it's cool to see these guys play because obviously 
uh, we don't get to see them because they're not here. But I think for me, it'll be nice to see the young guys, especially because we didn't really get to see we, what. How many games did they play at the World Juniors? Like three. They played three. Yeah. Like it, it, it's not a not a whole lot to not a whole to lot of games at, to watch. This is really random because the number of NCAA guys that have made it for me for for the, for the team. You know what this made me want to do? It made me want to watch Miracle again. Yeah, yeah. It kind of it kind of felt felt a little bit like that. I, I get that. Um, quick note before we move on. I saw Eric Stahl signed a PTO with the Iowa Wild. Mm-hmm. They now now did the who lost that trade? Who lost that trade? You Buffalo you, lost, lost that trade. Buffalo lost that trade. Yeah, because <laughs> okay, they lost Marcus Johansson. Yeah. And then they traded Eric Stahl for like a fifth to the Montreal okay. Canadiens. It was a fifth? Wow. It was like a fifth and something. And right. I don't know. They didn't really do anything with like, you know, asset management for the Buffalo for, Sabres. for Buffalo Sabres is, is really interesting to me, to be honest. It, it'll always be interesting. Um, um, but yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm, ha- I'm happy to see that because he, he mentioned too that he's, he has an itch to play again. Um, we had that speculation where they were interviewing Jordan Stahl about it, and he said that his brother wants to come back. And yeah, it'd be nice. Like, I, I, I would, I was surprised that he got the PTO now because I thought he would play in the Olympics first and yeah. then come back and get a PTO. Yeah. So just to point out, it does not stop him from going to the Olympics because it's mm. a PTO in the AHL. AHL players, I believe, can still go play. In, if it's an AHL contract, sorry. If it's an AHL contract, they can still go play in uh, in the Olympics. It's If it's a guy has who has an NHL deal. So I believe there was rumors about Mason McTavish going uh, to the Olympics for Canada. I do not think that can happen because he has an NHL contract. Uh, yeah, right it's now. interesting because so like, he's back at Peter. Br- oh, no, he got traded. <laughs> oh, he's with... Um, Man, I re- oh my gosh, we I don't remember. I don't remember where he but he, he did get traded. Peterborough Pete's and then yes. he got traded. Now I feel silly, but I don't. Hold on, I, I retweeted it. I'm gonna check it now. Okay, I'm gonna. I'll I'll go shout this person out quickly. Uh, Aisha Vizram from the LA Kings, who served on the bench on the 13th, which was three days ago. Um, as an athletic trainer for the LA Kings. Now they did tweet that uh, she was the believed to be the first female to work uh, a regular season NHL game behind the bench in any capacity. That is technically not true. Uh, Jody Van Reese, who was a former assistant athletic trainer for the Montreal Canadiens, became the first woman to work behind an NHL bench in 2002. Besides that, it's still great to see a woman behind Definitely, the bench yeah. in the NHL. Congrats to her. Um, I think that to have that visibility right now on the bench of more women in the game is something that um, I, I'm going to take it as a very, very small silver lining because there's only been one team right now. Okay. That yeah. he, These are the things where I'm like, hey, you want to change the game? Great, great. Keep doing more of that. Exactly. Um, did you find out who... Mason McDonald's yes, he traded. was traded to Adam's favorite team, the Hamilton Bulldogs. I should have known. I should have known. It's okay. Um, now, we have three more things. We have the Leafs, Habs, and we have the All-Star Game. Let's talk about the All-Star Game because the All-Star Game is what a nightmare. What now a that, nightmare it has been. I don't know. It's just I think for me recently... Um, I think I was a bit sour about this because in 2018, where they talked about profits, about players going to the Olympics, players not going to the Olympics. And then again, we're back to the idea that, okay, we're just having the all-star game now. We're not going, they're not going to the Olympics. So for me, I was kind of had like that bias going through. It's like, okay, I, I did, I didn't care who was really going. And then I guess it just kind of sunk in with me after when I started looking at the lineups and man, like, why did you still have to keep doing the representative thing? Like, why do you have to keep doing that? Like Sidney Crosby's not on the all-star team. Yeah. So I, I, I'll go through the, 
uh, teams real quickly here. Uh, so for the Metro, it's Sebastian Ajo, Claude Giroux, Jack Hughes, Chris Kreider, Alex Ovechkin, uh, who was the fan voted captain, Adam Fox, Adam Pellick, Zach Wierenski, uh, Freddie Anderson, and Tristan Jari. Okay. There is an ex- for me, there is an extremely notable name <sighs> missing. Obviously, you mentioned Sidney Crosby, but for me, it was Igor Shosturkin. Yeah, he's like a Where? Vesna candidate this year. He has been the best, probably the best goalie in the league. Like I, I'm I'm a huge fan of Jack Campbell, but I'm also not a huge fan of the Rangers defense. And I've been I've said that out loud. Like obviously. Uh, they have Adam Fox. They got guys there. I'm just still not set. I'm not set on them, but that's fine. Igor Shosturkin should absolutely be at the All Star game this year, and he's not even a last man in candidate. Yeah, I don't know. Just it, it was off off for me as well. That I think it was Brad Marchant didn't make it either. Yeah, he's like ninth in scoring. <laughs> yeah, it's- and. It's, it's weird to me that like, like the players you were expressing, it's just like, you don't have to keep doing the representative things. And again, I know Adam's not here, but all love to Nick Suzuki. Love the guy. Mm-hmm. I really love the player. I think he's going to get a lot better, but you know, this is not his brightest season. No, I, I don't, I don't like, think it's so. just, I don't know. Like it's weird how they're doing this. I know that um, they've doing the division things for quite some time now, but yeah. It's just, I don't know. It's just, it's weird. It's like, it's more excuses to make more jerseys, but to put less effort on them. Yeah. It's just all around. I'll, I'll let me finish off the, uh, the list here for the Atlantic. It's Batherson, Bergeron, Huberdo, Larkin, Matthews as the captain, Suzuki, Rasmus Dallin, Victor Hedman, Jack Campbell, Andre Vasilevsky. Uh, the central Connor, Kyle Connor, Alex Dabrinka. Alex Dabrinka has like 23 goals this year, by the way. <laughs> My <laughs> lord. Uh, Kirill Kaprizov, Clayton Keller, Jordan Cairo, Nathan McKinnon as the captain, Pavelski, Makar, Saros, Talbot. There, there is another name in there that's missing. Uh, Nazem Kadri. I know. Oh my God. I believe top five in scoring. Like, what, <laughs> what on earth? Uh, and lastly, the Pacific. Uh, Leon Dreisaitl, Eberle, Goudreau, Adrian Kempe, Connor McDavid as the captain, Timo Meyer, Mark Stone, Alex Petrangelo, and lastly, John Gibson and Thatcher Demko. So you, you mentioned it there. Like, why, why are we still doing the each player, each team must have a player there? Mm-hmm. Does it, 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 to me, I get it from the f- league's perspective but i just don't necessarily think we need it anymore like yeah uh, it was cool i guess but like i think after time like no offense to tyler bertuzzi when he made it that year or leo komarov we'll use leo komarov when leo komarov (laughs) made it to the all-star game no offense to leo komarov i don't think he should have been there like the leafs the leafs didn't deserve a spot that year yeah they really did it and no offense to rasmus dalin i don't know if they they had a really good start i just there's guys on these lists i look and say do they really need to be there yeah i, I think yeah it's really watered it down because i looked back on older also when they arguably i believe like in the early 2000s they had the best jerseys well, they're very colorful and you really did take best person available. And I think that for me, the fa- like the idea, like the fan vote where like you, you're only allowed to vote for these last man kind of things. It really does detach away the experience from it. Like if I'm thinking of myself as a younger person, like I want to be more involved in the process. I want to have my, you know, quote unquote voice heard on like who I think the best players are in the league. Right. And Right now, I, I don't. Know, I I think that there is the excitement of the three on three here, but I think just as I've gotten older, I just I don't know. I used to love the All Star Game, and now for me, it just it 
I don't know. It just feels like a mini game. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Uh, Nathan McKinnon spoke out. I don't know if you saw this quote, but yeah, Nathan McKinnon spoke out about Nazem Kadri not making the All Star game. It's silly. I don't think every team should send the guy. It's an All Star game, not a participation game. I love it. That is that is quite spot on. He didn't say it is what it is. <laughs> so if Adam was here, be one. like, yeah, that's Kyle, Nathan one. McKinnon. That's a good one. Nathan McKinnon, and then greater than Connor McDavid. No, <laughs> I think we did one like that already. Yeah, we did. We, yeah. we absolutely did. I very much remember remember doing that. Um, so they reported on last night on 32 Thoughts Headlines. That's what I'm calling it from now on, 32 Thoughts Headlines, that the breakaway challenge returns. I'm throwing on this, this on you last minute, but obviously it's very – it's really good because that was by far for me the best competition they had, and it mm. sucks that they took it away. Is there one moment for you when they used to have this challenge that sticks out? I think is, is it okay if I do two. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so my first one is um, I remember when they first got into the league, and Pittsburgh and Washington. I guess they were both rising in the East, and apparently there was an alleged thing. Malkin and Ovechkin had a rivalry. Okay. Like they just did not like each other. Like they didn't talk to each other on the Olympic team, and then they would get into like arguments and everything. And then I think this this is the one that connects us all in this podcast is Ilya Kovalchuk is okay. apparently was the arbitrator in establishing peace between the two Russian teammates on the Olympic team. <laughs> and now he's general manager of the Russian team. Yeah, of oh, the Russian uh, <laughs> Olympic hockey team. Um, and I can't remember if it was maybe 2012 where. We finally knew that the, the the feud was over when Ovechkin had Malkin help him with the breakaway challenge, and he was putting on like funny glasses and a hat. And I remember that, so that was really fun. And this one's gonna sound pretty biased, but it was I can't remember. I think it was 2013, 14. It was Corey Perry, and he just had this serious face on. He did this like I'll, I'll send a link after, but like he did this weird stick thing where he was able to hold the puck. Okay. Together, and then he was able to score, and I thought that was just really cool. Like maybe it's just my ducks bias, but those are the two things I remember from the breakaway challenge that I thought were really amazing. Okay, that <laughs> that's that's fair. I mine is uh very it's like feels like completely different, but uh, same year, twenty twelve, as you mentioned. I don't know uh, who he was. I'm trying to figure read this name plate here. I, I it was Sean. He was it was Sean Couturier. But he's not the main character here. It's Carey Price, uh, who is turned around, looking through the glass, making a save on Sean Couturier. Wow. That is it. Oh, yes. I remember that one. That was cool. That, I thought it was like the most, it wasn't, it was just funny, but like it fit the game. It's like, yes, this is what it's about. Trying just random crap. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't. It doesn't, but at least you try it, which I think kind of a ca- kind of just is what the NHL is right now in terms of the young guys like trying these crazy different things. I saw on the broadcast last night, like the last four, like Matthews in the last few games has just been trying to do the Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> and then obviously Trevor Zegras and Sonny Milano and uh, Andre Sveshnikov over the last couple of years have done, uh, some really cool things with the puck. And it's like, that's what this, this breakaway challenge is. And I think it's great that they're bringing it back. You think John Tortorella has a favorite moment in the breakaway challenge? Um, Whichever in cap, whichever <laughs> one is like the most basic and like the least creative like way. Defenseman taking a slap shot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. From the, from the spot. If he takes a slap shot, I bet that's his favorite. All one, right. For sure. <laughs> Sure. I will say no more before I, John Tortorella doesn't like me. Um, okay. So moving on from the all-star game, last two things. We'll start with the Habs. Uh, there was There is a GM update. It seems like we are getting closer to uh, a decision. Right now, it seems that we're down to the final three candidates. That will be Matthew Darsh, uh, Danny Briere, and Kent Hughes. Now, Kent Hughes, uh, Friedman, I think, reported last night on 32 Thoughts that it's, de- or 
Merrick did, sorry. Decision time for Kent, Kent Hughes. Uh, they need to know if he wants to be, if he's serious about, about this job. What do you think, like, of these three candidates, you have very different, I'd say you have very different candidates. One's a player agent who very much knows the business side of the game. You have Danny Briere, who has been in the ECHL for the last two or three years. And, you know, he's get got has a grip of, I guess, how the, the GM side works, but it's still, I think you'd say he lacks that experience. And you have a guy like Matthew Darsh who has been working uh, in the Tampa Bay lightning organization for a few years, especially under Julian Breezeby. And I believe he was there for both cups so he's been a part of a very successful organization is there any of them that really stand out to you i think for me it's matthew darsh and he is a hot commodity because right. he also got interviewed by the ducks right so i think he's someone that a lot of teams that are in need of a new gm are viewing as this is a guy winning mentality he's play he has the experience already and i think that there's not too much you want to do with him because he knows what he's doing already. Um, I think Danny Briere is a really smart hire, but not as a GM. I think it's going to be like a, a political candidate convention where he's going to lose out on it, but whoever becomes the GM, I think should bring him in, in as at least an assistant general manager to have yeah. someone in the system who knows the team, who knows the players, who's, been around is you know from what i've heard is a quite a likable guy in the montreal community with kent hughes um it's a guy where it's like it's like the most logical next step in his career from what he's been able to do already and i think that if you really want to go for that fundamental change of let's see what happens and let's let's do something new i think that that would be the type of hire kent hughes would be yeah, no, I think I think you're uh, spot on. I do agree with you with Matthew Darsh. I think in terms of if you look at the candidates, uh, I'd prefer, I'd also prefer Matthew Darsh. I believe Adam as well. But I think you make a good point there. And Engels also reported that uh, that we should expect a couple of the others that who were interviewed to possibly land jobs with with. Uh, with the club. And I think that makes sense in terms of, you know, you look at a guy like Danny Briere, who you mentioned, or we mentioned is working in the ECHL. If you bring him on as a, as an assistant general manager who would per se run the Laval rocket, like you're giving him that experience to maybe one day take over, uh, who knows, but I, I think you have so the Montreal Canadians, I think did a really smart thing in, in interviewing a diverse group of candidates in terms of like their experience and what they've done from a lot of experience to maybe not so, so much experience in terms of running a hockey club. Um, and I think what that does is it allows you to bring in guys you can bring in the most experienced guy as their general manager, but fill in around with guys you've also, or with guys and girls who you've also interviewed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree with that where it just, it's not like, I think that's the big thing we think about. It's just like, it's not just the one guy or one person you're going to look right. at there. It's going to be kind of like that team mentality moving forward or, what Jeff Gordon wants to do with the new management team and how he wants to set things up for there. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I, I definitely agree there. Before we move on to the two games that they've played, Adam has sent me a, a tweet. Uh, this is from an Arthur Staple uh, article, uh, and it seems to be that the Rangers are keeping an eye uh, on Lekkonen, and it could be a move uh, at the trade deadline. Now, one thing we do know uh, is obviously Sammy Blay is out for the rest of the season. Uh, Lekkonen will be an RFA at the end of the year. And Mark D'Amico is suggesting uh, a Kratzov for Lekkonen swap. Okay, I mean, 
I was going to say a second round pick is for Lekkonen because he has the RFA rights. Yep. But um, yeah, I can see that happening. I think that uh, for Tally Kraftsov, you, you could bring him into Montreal. Like he knows Jeff Gordon. And you could sell it to him saying, hey, if you work hard and if you are a team player right now, we'll give you time on the main club. And right. I think for the Rangers, and you know, they're going to take a hit with this, I think, because you already know what our Terry Lekkinen is. But he's a useful player that's going to be able to fit somewhere. Um, If a trade like that were to happen, it reminds me of two examples. So the first one is with the Rangers when they just kind of cut bait on Elias Anderson and just got whatever they could for him. Yep. Um, and that was really bad because he was seventh overall. Um, and another one is with the Islanders when... They rushed Nino Niederreiter. I remember he had like one goal in 55 games and for some reason would not send him back down to Bridgeport. Yeah. I remember that. And they traded him when he was, what, 20, 21 to the the Minnesota Wild for Cal Clutterbuck. And like, look at my idea. Like, that's like pretty uneven the way you look at that deal, but it gave the Islanders a useful player in their bottom six that you already know what he is. Yeah. And then you gave Niederreiter the opportunity to play top six minutes. So for me, those are the biggest comparisons. And I think like you add Arturi Lekin into the um, New York Rangers. And, and I think not only do you make them a better team now, but you do get Sammy Blay back, right? And obviously, will the, like assuming because Lekkonen's an RFA, you're not going to trade him as a rental and then trade him in the off season, right? That that doesn't make sense unless you're the Edmonton Oilers uh, and it's Andreas Athanasiu. But that's a different story. <laughs> that's a yeah. different story. <laughs> like I, I, I do think that it, it would be a a good fit for both teams. Like I think you get a, if let's say we're assuming Kratzov's involved, you get a younger guy who's is playing in Russia right now. Who's not necessarily like you have the opportunity to have another Jesse Pugliarvi in a sense, like, right. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what happened. Like Jesse Pugliarvi is like, no, I'm not signing with the Oilers <laughs> went back to Finland. And then obviously came back, signed with the Oilers, under different management. And I'd argue he had helped with the secondary scoring, whatever that's up for debate at the moment, but you have the opportunity. You have the opportunity there. With- I, I like it. If what the, I, I think what the Rangers are trying to do, because they have all of these really, you know, along with our Tammy Prenner, and they have the young guys, the young wingers who are developing. Um, and, you know, you're hoping that they become, the foundation of your offense. So if you're getting more of these quality top nine guys, like a Sammy Blay, a Arteri Lekkonen, or a Barclay Goudreau, who could just be those stability guys that help with the defensive game and some depth scoring, then, you know, I'm all for it. And it's interesting that they're, they're, they're bringing up this rumor now because I always, I think I kept saying Vitaly Kravtsev for Ben Chirot. So, I mean, like, you know, maybe I was not off there. Maybe I'm not off maybe there. Where it's just like off. the Rangers want immediate help somewhere along the lineup. I'd be interested to hear what Adam has, has to say about, you know, I, I, Arturi Lekanen is obviously, he's 26, year, 26 years old. Vitaly Kratsov, I think, is 21. 21. Um, yeah. But he, Arturi Lekanen has been an extremely serviceable player for the Montreal Canadiens. Uh, or useful player for the Montreal Canadiens when he's there. I just would, I, I'd like to hear what he has to think about that in terms of, you know, giving up a player like Arturi Lekkinen. Yeah. Uh, um, now, so they had, they've had two games since the last time we talked. They had a game against the Bruins where they lost 5 1. Brad Marchand uh, had a hat trick. And there was a couple of things that came out of that game. First one, I do want to shout out Michael Pizzetta, who, you know, obviously he's a guy who has come up due to the COVID and uh, injury situation in Montreal. And he's not necessarily, I think he has four points in 20 or so games uh, with the Canadians, but 
he's doing everything else. He's doing everything else. Just such a good job for the Canadians. And, and I think for me, it encapsulates what the Montreal Canadians were last year, where it was everyone just busting their ass the entire time. And it feels like Michael Pizzetta is a, is exactly what they were. Is he a Jake Evans 2.0? Yeah. You know what? I was going to make that comparison. I was glad. I was glad that you brought that up because that's what it, it, it feels like in a way it's like Jake Evans isn't going to score 60 points in a season. I don't think maybe he will, who, who knows, but I think he's an extremely serviceable player who can do good f- for the team uh, in the future. And now like with the injuries and, and such that are going on. Um <laughs> Did you happen to see the, the headbutt? Yes. <laughs> Here's why. <one. laughs> I just, uh, I'm just so, you know, th- this year with the NHL in terms of uh, suspensions have been, I mean, we haven't talked about a whole lot of them, but it's just funny. We've gone from biting and now we're talking about headbutting and it's Slewfoot. like slew foots or the lack of calls on the slew foots. It's just so, it's so funny. They're getting more creative with the way they're getting suspended. And I don't know, it's just weird. Like, I think maybe Chris Wam, he just really buys into the Montreal Boston thing. But that was, I don't know. Fair. No, he was just, I, I wanted to bring it up and I saw it on the dock. I, it was just, I thought it was so comical because, like, you know, we went, we were literally how many months ago we were talking about uh, Brendan Lemieux biting Brady Kachuk and yeah. the explanation being so funny. It's just with Chris Weidman, he literally headbutts, headbutts someone. <laughs> um, I just, I, I want to bring that up. I know this is your absolute favorite goalie of all time. Did you see Andrew Raycroft? Oh my goodness. That guy is like, he chose violence. He did choose violence. Did. Yeah. And he doubled I, down on it. He's like, Oh, look how many did. responses my tweet got. So uh, I believe after the game with the Bruins, he tweeted that uh, how in the world did this hashtag go Habs go team go to the fi- Stanley cup finals last season. People were dunking on him because um in 2000, the 2004 playoffs in the first round, um, Raycroft had a 2-0 lead for the Bruins over the Canadians, and then he lost four in a row. So everyone keeps bringing that up. And then yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, you think you're, you're, you're feeding into it if you, you take it personally, <laughs> Andrew Raycroft. Exactly. No, uh, it's just, it's such an obvious answer as to the difference in, in these teams, number one, like the major amounts of injuries this team has suffered. Uh, plus the fact that, you know, they lost Philip Deneau. They lost Jesperi Kotkaniemi to um, an offer sheet. And now Shea Weber and Carrie Shea Weber might never play again. And Carey Price uh, has not touched, has, hasn't played for the team uh, this year. So, you know, that is the answer. It was just a stupid question. It's like, I come on, Andrew. <laughs> like, I the, the, and like the response that he chose to show in the his double down tweet was the fact you played in the NHL and can't answer this by yourself. LMAO. It's like, come on, Andrew. If we're on a first name basis, like, you got to know. Like, I, I don't know if you're being facetious in tweeting that. You know like what he was doing. He clear, like he must have known what he was doing. Like, but it's just such a silly question. And, and it's like, this is not the fan base you want to deal with right now, in my opinion. I, I never expected this following him on uh <laughs> social media because um I think he knows he just he's very conscious about the idea people have of him and then the things he puts out because I know he works as he works on reporting on the Bruins, right? Yeah. But man, like I have never seen anyone else tweet about Tukarask this much as Andrew Raycroft. So are, are, we're, we're, we're assuming that people in Boston are now fans of Tukarask? Yeah, of course. That's I mean, no, they always game. were. Nothing ever happened. Is oh, Raycon. come on. Come on. <laughs> Give it five games. I'm sure he'll let in one bad goal and then he'll just completely turn over. Just completely change. Oh, I, I do that to goalies and I hate it. I know. It's the um, worst. 
let's move on to their second game because this one was a little more, uh, let's call it controversial. It's a bit of everything happened in that game, didn't it? Yeah. So I didn't get to to watch that game, but I did see the OT goal. Did you see the OT goal? I did see the OT goal. What on earth happened there? I do not know. It's like, it's a complete collapse of things. I'm just like, well, okay. Like for me at that point, we was watching it. We're just like, okay, whatever happens, happens at this point. Because I, I admit I was, I was writing out the whole part of like, oh, it's three, one, like, okay. They're learning from their Arizona game. And then things began to slide for me. So I'm just like, where is this game going? Well, but the, but did you see the goal? Did you see the the review? Um, can you tell me about it again? Like, what okay, so yeah. Mike Haas, so the Philip Kurishev has essentially it looks like a breakaway, and Mike Hoffman is back checking, and then I guess he kind of loses control, and they both he kind of pushes Kurishev. They both run into, uh, into Samuel Montembeau. Oh, by oh, the okay, way, sorry. Jake I, Allen I, is I, injured. Alex. Yes. Did you think I was talking about the? Leafs? I think you're talking about the Leafs. No, no, no. I'm talking, no it's okay. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> okay. Talk, so what talk, I just talk, said did not make sense at all. No, I'm like <laughs> the Coyotes. I'm thinking about this. I'm like, that doesn't make sense. Because like, you're like moving talk- on to their second game. I'm like, okay, <laughs> did we talk about the Coyotes? So that's why I'm like, okay, we're still on the house. No, Sorry, we're still Adam. on the house. <laughs> no, but did you see the overtime goal with Philip Kurashev? And yes, that Mike was Hoffman. hilarious. Like, what is going on? So you know how that. You know how I found out we were talking about that? I'm like, wait, Mike Hoffman's not on the blues anymore. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, I don't know what that was. Um, I just remember watching it and going right to Twitter after. First, I saw um, Eric Engels just playing ha 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 ha. And then Adam right after tweeting um, that he's like lost a bit of love for the game or respect for the game. Yeah, like it, it just it was so messy because like I think we the, the first part of the review was the goal. Uh, was it a goal? And I think we had a similar type of goal a few months ago. Uh, the Leafs were playing. I don't remember who, but I think it was a Jason Spezza goal where the net was off. But because of the circumstances, it was a goal where they lost me was the offside. So first off. Why weren't you doing both reviews at the same time? Like there was no reason that the, if, if my understanding is correct, it was an official review. So it's not like Montreal or Chicago asked for it. So now you're reviewing two things separately where you could have just done it at the same time. And second, I I thought he was offside. Like I thought he was clearly offside by, by inches like he didn't have control of the puck and if that's the rule i i just don't see yes the puck was on his stick i guess not even but like still he was offside like i don't see how you called that otherwise that that was kind of a disgrace same here i don't know like he's always shoddy and i think it's just when it comes to these overtime things like you know there's that tension there there's that Okay, what's going to happen next? Let's keep things tight. And then the way for a game to end like that, it's so deflating that the, offic- the officiating was shaky. I hope I don't get fined saying that. Um, $25,000. Yeah. That um, it just there wasn't the consistency throughout the game. And I don't know. It's just there's no victory. Like you always talk about moral victories. We talk about anything here. It's just kind of like a disappointment for me. Yeah, like it was just such a, it was such an egregious missed call in my opinion that it's like, what on earth happened? Like, what were they, what were they watching? And this is another time where, like, I think it'd be nice to, and I don't know if the referees, I believe the referees made the final call, like. Why they should be available after the game to very much explain why that wasn't offside? Because to a lot of people, that was uh, that was offside. No, you give us too much information. That's why you know that what we, it would give us too much information into yeah. looking into the game. Get that out of here! We, we we're not allowed to do that. 
Daniel, you're right, but I'm not having it. I'm not yeah. having any any of that explanation. Can you imagine us as journalists, like the next time we cover a game, it's like, um, oh yeah, is that ref also free for comment? <laughs> like he's beside like Kyle Dubis and Austin Matthews and Sheldon Keith. It's yeah. like, all right, what does the ref have to say about this? No, I know. I, I, I it would be it would be spectacular. But I just I wish we could hear what they have to say because I believe that's a th- a thing in football a little bit and I, I don't know but I know in basketball that's a that's a thing right yeah they'd um later like if uh, oh. there was a missed call yeah. they'd mention it that like we made this mistake see accountability it's okay it happens we accountability if yeah exactly if you just admit to your mistakes and try to fix it it's like a, I don't know I don't think I'm asking for a too lo- a, a lot from the NHL um now, now we're talking about the Leafs. Now we're talking okay. about the Leafs. Now we're talking about the Leafs. So you don't don't want to get confused. Um, they've had you know what before the games. Did you see Brad Marchand's a longtime Leaf fan? He is. Oh my gosh, I knew it. Oh, it's that one hurt. I don't know how to feel about that. Like it was just so conflated. Like, like ah, confl- It was so conflicting because it's like it's Brad Marchand, but it's like ah, but it's, you know Brad, it felt but like? it's Brad Marchand. <laughs> You know what it felt like when Adam says I'm not a real Jordan Bimington fan? You? Yeah. But I'm technically his biggest fan here on the podcast. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you yeah. absolutely are. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm sure you loved that game last night. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Like, when, okay, now I'm back onto the right one where I'm like, yeah. I was excited. I, like, the scoring is back that they're able to kind of like, get things around. And shout out to Timothy Lilligren on his first career goal. Yeah. But oh my gosh, you need to tighten things up against a team like the St. Louis Blues that, you know, was a back and forth at one point. Yeah, and they blew another 3-1 lead, which is just, I I absolutely love to see it. Um, not really, I'm being sarcastic. Please, Leafs, if anyone's listening, do not blow another lead. I don't like it. Um, it just felt to me like the last few games have been disappointing from my perspective, because the, you know, they started the season a little slow um, and then they had this really good set of games, but these last few games, well, yes, they've won a couple of them. They won the Vegas game and they won uh, the St. Louis game last night. It just feels not that they're like, not that they don't care, but it just felt like the mistakes were so prominent because they're not in, in, Arizona's case, it was a little bit different, but in St. Louis's case, time and time again, those mistakes were biting them where they were getting really good scoring chances. And unfortunately, while Jack Campbell has been a very good goalie for most of this season, last night was not one of his best nights Mm -hmm. um, in terms of some of the goals that he he probably wish he had back. So, you know, I think we had this discussion a few uh, a couple months ago, maybe, but like we were talking about what do the Leafs need at the deadline for me? Like number one is another defenseman. Like it's just, it's, I, I don't see the issues up front that I do see on the back end. Yeah. I agree with that, that they have to tighten things up. Um, I thought they did pretty well against Arizona. I know that they outshot them like crazy, but that's just, I don't know, it's such an obvious loss for me, the Coyotes. But then with the Blues, it's like, for me, I'm like, okay, you got the offense back. But then things started kind of crumbling on the back end again, where I'm like, okay, what happened this time around? I know Jack Campbell didn't really have the best games he had, but I don't know, for me, it was just, it was just those situations where, like, the Coyotes is a type of game you have to win. And I know that they didn't give enough scoring support for Peter Morazic. I, I don't necessarily blame him for that one, but mm, agree yeah, to disagree. Okay. Agree yeah. to disagree. The first I think goal was pretty bad. I, I think they're. You're right. They didn't. Uh, what's his name? Vejmelka. Uh, that's as good as it's going to get for me. Uh, Vejmelka was it? I like stood on his head. Apparently, every time it just seems like you know. Remember a few years ago, it was Alex Georgiev, where every time yeah. they played the Leafs, he was just an absolute stud. Well, last the few nights ago, that was Vejmelka. I just wish you're right. Like the scoring wasn't there, and then it's just kind of like for St. Louis. It's like yes, you could have the scoring now, 
but you're also going to let in five goals. It was rough to watch. Like it was just so back and forth, which is good when your goalie's good. Like that Vegas game, the first period, I thought it was quite a, or the first couple periods, I thought it was quite a back and forth game and I enjoyed it. But it's like when your goalie's not sharp and I don't, I think St. Louis fans are having the same conversation. Like I don't, necessarily think Jordan Bennington was on point last night either. Like three of the six goals were, were in the same spot. Essentially the sixth one was, I don't even like six. One was like a complete fluke. The Ilya Mikheyev goal felt like Mm. kind of fluky, Um, but this, he was getting beat on the right side, top right side. Um, the three games, um, not including Coyotes one, unfortunately, but the three yeah. games that the Leafs have had recently, um, you know, they're against contenders, Colorado, Vegas, St. Louis. And I think there's three different samples you have there where, okay, this is what you're going to expect in a playoff situation. These types of teams right. um, play, be- play like you played against Vegas, you know, be that team you can be. Um, for Colorado, be that team that you were like that for 60%, 66% of the game. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the thing. Like, learn to finish. And then I think with the Blues, it's like you're not going to get lucky like that all the time. Yeah, no, I, I think you're you're pretty spot on there. And, you know, obviously the refs came up again. And I say again, it's we can complain about the refs all we want. Um, and again, like I'm not, I, it's not going to stop me from complaining about the refs, but at the same time, remember that when we enter the playoffs, the refs let a lot more slide. Yeah. And if it's going to trouble you in the regular season, it's going to trouble you in the playoffs. Like that's just what's going to happen. So you have to find a way to get around the fact that the refs aren't going to call everything, whether that's scoring goals, whether that's pushing back, like you have to do something. And I find sometimes recently there wasn't that there like, yes. Okay. They won two of the two, two of those games against contenders, but they still blew that lead against Colorado where the left refs weren't great. They blew a lead against Vegas where the refs weren't great. They blew a lead against St. Louis and they won where the refs weren't great. Okay. So, but I don't necessarily think their performances outside of that were spectacular, especially defensively. Yeah. Not at all. So you have to tighten it. Like you said at the beginning, they have to tighten that up. Mm-hmm. And I think, yeah, the major lessons this week of what they need to do. The, co- like the Coyotes game, I don't know. That's just kind of like an outlier to me. Um, I mean, like you have to find ways to still score, but yeah, like those three games w- against the contenders, where you know these are the these are the real challenges. These are the ones that you're you don't know you're going to face in the first round, but like these are the type of teams making the playoffs who are going to be of that caliber. And again, Leafs need to tighten things up. Like we've we've mentioned already before, like how things sl- slid against Montreal. Like you, yeah. like that should be the biggest lesson you have right now. And then I think. For the regular season now is just you know put those lessons into motion. Oh, so I have their the standings up here. Sorry, they are most likely going to play Tampa Bay, maybe Florida if Tampa Bay hops over them. But right now, because Florida has been absolutely dominant lately, uh, it seemingly is going to be Tampa Bay, and that's not an easy matchup. No, that's not. Um, and uh, I, I just I I hope by the time we get to the playoffs, we see the we see the the team that showed up, you know, just before everything, you know, got, everything was getting postponed. Like that was a that was or I thought was a really good team. And you brought up uh, contender. They've been playing contenders the last few games. Uh, I think their biggest test, in my opinion, comes up on Wednesday. And that's the New York Rangers. Mm -hmm. Like, I I think that's a game to look at and say, you know, like the Rangers are a very good team. And right now they're without Igor Shosturkin and they're still producing like they are. So that's going to be huge for them. Yeah. Another test. Yeah. Like, I think that's a huge game uh, 
for the Leafs to look up and say, okay, where are we? Because if they show up and do what they did against St. Louis, I don't think it's, in my opinion, it doesn't, it's not going to go well. Mm-hmm. It, that, that's it for me, like personally. Um, do you have anything else to say about the Leafs before we wrap this show up? No, I'm good. Um, I just kind of thought of like, you know, we didn't do the uh, Canada hockey card gang, but um, that's okay. I know. You know what? Cause you know what happened? Because the first time we were going to do it when they first came out, yeah, I yeah. went to my local Tim Hortons and uh, didn't have them. It's okay. <laughs> Okay, I think that is everything for mm-hmm. today. I just double checked Twitter. Yeah. I do not see anything else. Anything it's right all now. just football because no, it's going to break before, like five minutes after this. I so know. It's okay. I yeah. know. It's going to be just splendid. Um, thank you for listening to another episode, the Two on One Podcast. If you enjoyed it, make sure you like and subscribe if you can. Leave a review on Apple uh, and Spotify. Check out our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. All that stuff's down below. And then our all our individual stuff. Uh, all our stuff is down below. My blog, Daniel's uh, CJRU stuff, and Adam's YouTube page. And I, we will see you on Wednesday. Wednesday. Bye, guys.